want to extend my uh, wife's love and also wishes that she could be here with you today. Uh, it was not a good week for her physically. And last evening when I got home from work at the hospital, I looked at her and said, You're not, we're not going to Sunday school, are we? She says, no, I don't think I can. Then she came out of bed this morning preparing what I thought would be to come to church. I said, I'm probably not going to church. She says, no, no, I can't. I just don't feel well. So she sends her love and greetings and could not be here today with her uh, health challenges that she has. I want to speak to you about the heart of God. We have just talked about the children, and you found what was more in their heart today. Pretzel bites, not beans. All right. Uh, there is a passage in the Bible that is one of my absolute favorites, and it's one that I think virtually everybody who grew up in church knows, and that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world. But the kids were talking to me. Now I want you to talk to me. God was, because all of this was created for His glory, guess what? He loves the world. But the pinnacle of it all was the only thing made in His image was you and I. That's it, man. And when I say, for God so loved the world, I'm going to stop, and what I want you to do is say out loud your name, okay? For God so loved. Kids did better than that. I want you to say your name out. For God so loved. That's right. Now, folks, this is a big week. It's a big, big week. Week. Now, <clears throat> since I already have you talking out loud, I want you to talk out loud one more time. What week is this? What week is this? Say it out loud. <laughs> Hallmark holiday. <clears throat> I want to ask a question. Shannon, you know, I was seeing him at the gym, but it's like, man, he looks familiar. But I couldn't place him. I thought, have I arrested this guy before? <laughs> do, do, do I know him from church? Do, how do I, I don't, and he was kind enough about it. What was it, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago? He, he came up to me. He says, I thought that was you. I said, and I know who you are. But I didn't have him all the way over here in Bellevue Bottoms. Shannon, yeah, okay, yeah. He, he, oh, thank you. Let me ask, when I asked that question, Shannon, honestly speaking, when I said, what week is this? Did you think Super Bowl or Valentine's? Super Bowl. <sighs> I'm going to help you out, brother. <clears throat> What's that? A farm machinery show. I'm going to help you out too, brother. <laughs> Valentine's. You guys surprised me just like this kid. Broccoli? Are you kidding? Hot dogs? Mac and cheese? I, no, no sweets in all. Shannon, let me ask, who is that young lady sitting right beside you? Your wife, Sue. Um, do you, do you love Sue? No. Okay. <laughs> he, he he loves Sue. Now earlier, he said Super Bowl. This is Super Bowl week, not Valentine's Day. Now, the poor guy set him up, but Miss Sue, I hope he redeemed himself by saying, I love her. We'll forget the most of the time thing, okay? Um, the idea is this. We, this week is about love. It, and I happen to love football, so Super Bowl can fit in there. But let me ask you a question here, Shannon. Do you love Super Bowl better? Or do you love your wife better? Depends on who's playing. <laughs> I'm trying to help you, brother. <laughs> it's Miss Sue. Sue over the Super Bowl. We just passed the Christmas season of giving. The Christmas season of giving is an opportunity to show love. I was blown away on January the 8th. If I remember, you guys gave the world missions, uh, what was it, just over 15,000, approaching 16,000? Yes, and, and that was 15,000, 16,000? 
12,000, okay, $12,000 for people you don't see and you may never see until you embrace them in heaven. Say, by the grace of Christ, you're here as am I. Your generosity of giving to perfect strangers that they might become part of the family of Christ. Christmas Day, you gave gifts to show your love and affection for others. What would you say if, how impressed would you be if I said, I gave this to Jenny? Could you ha put that first uh, power slide up there for Christmas? An MS-180CBE steel chainsaw. Ladies, how many of you would be impressed? God bless you. God bless you. I knew I'd probably have one. And how did I know I'd have one? Could you put that next slide up there? I want you to know, absolutely easy to start. This is one of the reviews. Cuts, excellent, a wonderful product. And who's the name there? Molly. Miss Molly back there. Now, I will tell you, I did not give my wife a chainsaw for Christmas, even though I've used one for almost 30 years heating my house. Instead, this is what I gave to my wife. One of the things that uh, I gave her was this plaque that I had uh, engraved by computer engraving. And you see the three prominent words, three times a lady. That song came out in 1978, in late June. Lionel Richie wrote the song. Now let me set the, set, the, the scene for you here. Jenny and I were dating, but that's all. That's all. I, I had no prospects that she was going to be my future bride. We were dating, but we met back in Knoxville and stayed in a professor's home, separate bedrooms. And uh, because I had my 1966 Chevrolet pickup had broken down and lost its transmission and I had to go and tow bar it back home. But we had a day together. We went to Westtown Mall and we were in some store and this is 1970s again, disco era. Some of y'all might remember that. Some of y'all lived that and some of you still apologize for the pictures from that era. And what happened is Jenny's doing her girly stuff and I'm doing my guidey stuff. And we just happened to meet right up in the middle of the store. And yes, believe it or not, as well as spinning crystal balls and a light hit it, uh, was already on it. But you have these dazzling lights appearing around us and all of a sudden Lionel Richie's. You're once, twice. And I was looking at Jenny, she looked at me. And I swear, I promise you, it literally, the only time it ever happened to me, it was like an Elvis Presley movement moment. We were there, the whole store just disappeared. I'm looking at Jenny, she's looking at me. And I swear, it seemed like we were on this revolving carousel. I guess it was from the light refractions. I looked at her, I thought, oh, she's beautiful. Oh my gosh, she's wonderful. Oh my gosh, this could be her. That became our song, Three Times a Lady. Periodically, I play that for her. Not me singing it, not me playing anything, pushing but a play on something. Three Times a Lady. That spoke to her at Christmas. She had no idea that was coming because it took the time not to get her a steel chainsaw, but instead to speak to her heart. I want us to stand here just a moment as we share in God's word about what is at the heart of God. What gift, if you were to offer God now, what would it be? Now, obviously, every believer in Christ knows the number one gift is yourself. The giving of your heart to Christ. The last time I spoke to you, I was privileged to speak here it was on January the 8th. And I spoke on this same passage from John chapter 21. And as I spoke, it was about the gift of a new year that God had given us. And what had happened was Peter, now in John 21, is facing an abysmal failure of his life. The one who had just the very night of his betrayal said, I would die for you, fled from Christ. But prior to fleeing from him, denied him three times and that burnt it into his soul. Those three denials. And in John chapter 21, as they're out, Peter said, I'm going to go out fishing. Back to fishing for fish when Jesus in the beginning had called him to do what? Fish 
for men. But his failure was keeping him from going forward. And all night long they fished, all night long, and they came up with nothing. A professional fisherman came up with nothing, and then they hear a voice on the far seashore over 100 yards away, at about 100 yards, John says. And that figure of a man in the bobbing, they did not realize who it was, and Jesus says, throw your net on the other side. Why not? Maybe he knows more about this fishing hole than we do. Boom. They pulled it in and almost sank the boat. And John immediately recognized, that's Jesus. Peter clothed himself with his outer garment, swam into the, to the seashore, and Jesus not only blessed them with abundance, but he also did this. He already prepared them a meal, cooking on the seashore. Guys, have some food. And then we come to this passage of Scripture that I want to read for you today. But before I do that, I just want you to know, last time I was here speaking on this passage, I mentioned there's some, some Greek words here, because the Bible was written in New Testament Koine Greek, in the New Testament it was written in Koine Greek. I said I didn't have time to get into those things. Today we're going to take time, and the reason being is crystal. On January the 8th, she got up and she says, we need one more children's church leader or youth leader. And right then I said, okay, God, next time, if there is a next time, I'm going to speak on John 21. Would you stand with me? John 21, verse 15 to 18. In honor of the word of God as he speaks to us. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then Jesus spoke to him a third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And now this is the second time we find this phrase, feed my sheep. The first time was feed my lambs. The second time was take care of my sheep. The third time now is feed my sheep. Peter was hurt because the Lord asked him that third time, do you love me, he said. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Would you be seated? He goes on and tells him that the time was going to come where Peter would be led by others, not because it's necessarily where he wanted to go. He'd even be clothed by others, not just because that was what he wanted to wear. There comes a time we trust in others to do for us what we cannot do. The number one way to show your love for Christ is in that complete surrender of yourself to Christ. But then what? On August the 11th, 1979, at 2.30 in the afternoon, I showed Jenny how much I loved her by promising to surrender who I had been for 21 years to find out who God wanted to be in us. One part of me ceased to exist as it was I to become we. As God was forming something new, as two were becoming one and creating something anew. The first thing I want to point out here is that there is a priority that Jesus is mentioning here in verse 15. And that priority is of children. And this is speaking of reproduction. Now, as I talk about this, I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds, but we're not going to go real deep into the weeds. Perfectly understandable, I hope, as we do this. In Genesis chapter 1 in the, in the book of creation, the Bible says that God made them male and female, and He created them as thus, and He blessed them and said to them, what? Be fruitful and multiply. You reproduce in number. Reproduction is exactly what God wanted in the husband-wife relationship in creation. But guess what God wants also of us as believers in Christ? We become family together and He still wants reproduction. In Matthew chapter 28, the great commission of Christ. As you go into all the world and disciple them, 
You're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and to teach them all of my commandments. He didn't want us to sit and soak in church. He wanted us to reproduce as the church. In creation, God put a priority on reproduction. And in his new creation, the church, he put a priority on reproduction. Now, how do I get children out of this? The question that Jesus asked, the actual Greek is that first word, agapes. You'll see it translated, transliterated into the English language, agape. Do you agape me? Do you agapas be more than these things? Jesus was, I think, calling Peter out that, Peter, I didn't call you to be a fisherman. I called you to be a fisher of men. I was fishing last night. One medical village drive. I was fishing last night. I did some fishing in the ER with some Christians who needed encouragement. There's a young man that I'm fishing intentionally for to lead him into a relationship with Christ. Generally speaking, there's others I was fishing for just hoping that maybe they'd taste something in my life that they would want to test the hook out. Guess what? That's what we all do. Your job is not your job to go and earn money for your family. Great that you're providing. Your job is not to provide a future education. Your job is to provide a current investment in your children, in your family, in your community as you fish for men. Jesus said, do you love me? Now that was the question. The word, it, it, we're, we're different about it. How many, do we have any pizza lovers here? Anybody? Yeah. How about this? Do we have anybody that, I love meaty pizzas. You know, it's got to be covered with meat. Any, any, of the, any of you meaty pizza lovers? Okay. So not only is a pizza lover, you like a particular type of pizza. You throw some fruits and veggies if you want, but you want that triple, quadruple pounds of meat, correct? Well, that's good. We, we, we've narrowed that down. So when it comes to Oh, let me ask you, brother. I, I don't. Who's that lovely young lady sitting by you? Your wife. Do you love her? What's your name, ma'am? Bethany. Bethany, and your your name, sir? Clinton. Clinton loves Bethany. Shannon loves Sue. We got something going here. Great theme. Valentine's Day is coming, and not only that, Clinton. Loves meaty pizza. So, Miss Bethany, you're on the level of a pizza. <laughs> is that true, Clinton? No. Depends on how hungry he is, if he wants to dig a dog, uh, a, a hole. No, no, not at all. In the English language, we use the term love kind of loosely. We can say, oh, man, I love a meaty pizza. Oh, yeah, I'm committed. committed. I love my wife. The problem is, that's not what we mean. The Greek language was far more narrow than we tend to be. They had a word called storge, which means affection. It's, it's, it's really nice. How many of you have been working on a hot, hot, sultry summer day? You're just wrung out, and you've gotten the cool breeze that comes across, and you go, oh, that feels so good. How many of you have been beaten down before? Beaten, I mean beaten down, and somebody comes up and out of the blue you weren't expecting it, shares a kind word to you. That's storge. It's, it's oh wow, I, I, I needed that. I needed that affection. How many of you at the end of, of, a, of a storm, a terrible storm, walked out and just as the sun was setting and the storm has moved on, you're able to look out the horizon and see the beauty of the sunset and what that came because of the storm. That's what storge means. There's another word they had in the Greek language, the word eros. We get our word erotica or erotic. Now, erotic is, can be bad, can be good. There are people who worship God in nature but never know the God of the Bible. Guess what? Nature gets in the way then, what God used as a pointer. Erotica, this perversion of trying to fill our lusts in anything but what God has said, 
in the husband-wife relationship is a deception. Erotic is sexual, sensual pleasure that we can have in a relationship, in the God-ordained relationship. They had another word called philos. Now, the word philos is BFF. I couldn't have said that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, maybe. What's BFF mean? Best friends forever. It's a dying term, I realize. BFF. Some of you have childhood friends that when you hook up, not only do you talk about the good old days when you were in kids together and relive some of those moments that your parents didn't know about. <laughs> I mean, the stories that, well, maybe you later told them that, yeah, yeah, that filled with the bulls in them. We used to go play in that field. Found that out from my elementary age daughters after they became adults. My wife, my mom actually thought when we went tent camping on the Malden former military air base that we were actually sleeping in the tent all night. When she heard later as adult sons, we were telling her what we did. It wasn't criminal. Scotty, talk, you guys, what? Best friends forever. Those are the stories and not only that, the commonality. They are the best friends. But agape is a different word. It means sacrificial love. Charity that's given without expectation of return. The giving of love when it likely won't be returned. It's unconditionally given. Jesus said, do you unconditionally love me more than these? And what did Peter say? I really, really, really BFF you. Uh, we're like this, Jesus. That was his response. And you know what Jesus said about that? He says, here's what I want you to do then, Peter. I want you to feed my lambs. Now, I'm not going to go too deep in the weeds because if you do that, you come up with poison ivy. But the word lambs there is in the Greek language of a younger sheep. Now, it was fascinating getting to know Bob and his daughter. Uh, you know, I still got to make that trip out to your sheep farm. And, and I'm just fascinated by it. And I wish I could have done that before this message because he could teach me a whole lot about sheep that I don't know. How dependent are lambs? Little baby sheep. Totally dependent. Totally dependent. How, let me put it in the human world. How dependent are babies? Absolutely dependent on everything. They don't come self-changing. Oh, hand me the pampers. Doesn't work that way. They don't go, hmm, no, go to the refrigerator and check what kind of milk I want. No, that's not, that's a little too tepid for me. Here, I'll take it out of the microwave a little bit soon. They don't do that. They are 100% absolutely dependent on us for everything. It's amazing about babies when they come into the world. They change the entire atmosphere of things, don't they? Um, let me dwell on this word agape and show you what this sacrificial love is. The Bible in John 3, 16, when you just said, For God so loved, say your name. Uh, For God so loved. It's interesting that John uses the word agape. Unconditionally loved you and me and this world. Vile and filthy as it is, and vile and filthy as sometimes we have been or can yet be. Another place that one of my favorite scriptures, I've shared it with you, but Romans chapter 5, verse 6, talks about this, about God demonstrating His love. Now, demonstration means proof. All right? It talks about this. It says, you see, when we were powerless... Little baby, can't help herself, can't clean herself, can't feed herself. When we were powerless, Christ died, not for that cute little baby, for the ungodly. And then he brings up this theory. He says, now, very rarely will anyone die for another man. Very rarely. How many of you have died for someone else? You have not because you're here. 
uh, just uh, north of here is a cemetery. I'm going to guess there may have been someone that was killed in the line of duty, someone that may have been killed in combat. My dad as a combat officer said, when we were under fire, I was not fighting at that point for my country. I was fighting for the guy next to me. I was fighting for that 19 year old kid as I was 35 and, and I was keeping my guys alive. There are probably some grave signs. And, and so John or, or Paul in Romans 5 says, very rarely will anyone die for another man, though for a good man they might possibly dare to die. And then he says this, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were powerless because of sin, he died for the ungodly. Can you imagine what that is as a combat soldier? I'm going to save my enemy's life. Not because he's an enemy of mine, but he declared himself to be an enemy of mine. That's the level of God's love. But God demonstrates his love. And guess what word is used there? Agape. Agapao. Unconditional, self-sacrificing love. That's what Christ did. And what did Peter do? He denied Christ. Good friend. But a fair weather friend. He fled. I want to be a, a friend of BFF. But unconditional, sacrificial. The answer of Jesus said, Peter, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed the completely helpless. Give them what they need to grow without expecting anything in return. You nurture them. You clean them up. You sacrifice for them. That's what I want you to do. You want to get near to my heart. That's what you do. Have you noticed how, again, the baby changes the atmosphere? I... I will tell you, I have no recall whatsoever before my 20s holding a baby. Maybe I did. I just don't remember it because they were like, you know, they'll probably do something that I think is unpleasant. And knowing that, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I might break them. I, I, and I remember it as a young pastor before Jenny and I were blessed with children and we'd have that Sunday where the babies brought the first time and we'd pray over the parents and the babies and they'd hand me that baby outside. I was just looking and playing the part inside. I was going, don't drop it. Don't break it. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I know how to pray. And I would pray, but never felt, it, never felt comfortable. Then along came my kids. I found, oh, they're not that fragile. My wife calls me the baby hog now. There's something else that women said that I never understood. The smell of a baby. I never understood that till I had a baby. Because it never got close enough to go. <sighs> but I can tell you right now, it's burned in my memories. The smell of my beans, but also the smell of a baby. I, I mean... There is something there about a newborn baby. It does have, and, and it feels so good. Something about a baby when they enter the room. Have you ever noticed when you take a child or a baby into a nursing home, what happens? Have you ever done that? Just taken a young one into a nursing home where you'd have some people just sitting there in wheelchairs, maybe holding a baby doll, but in their own world, maybe muttering, or maybe they're in stone cold silence. I don't know how many times I've taken my daughters when they were little into the nursing home, and now my granddaughter and grandson, the youngest ones, and life. Their eyes light up. It changes the room. But there's also something else babies do smell. If you don't, try this test sometime. Have five men in the room and five women in the room, and the baby has an accident. And you'll have two or three of the women that probably will offer, oh, here, I'll change them. And you'll find guys all of a sudden, hey, check out that ball game. <laughs> you know, I mean, babies do unpleasant things. How many of you took your child or grandchild and fell asleep with them in the chair? And it's just one heartbeat matching the other. And it's amazing. You become one. But yet, how many of you have said, Oh, dear Lord, please, will you make them shut up? Babies do unpleasant things. 
babies. I remember when my oldest daughter got pregnant when her, with her first grandson, who is now 15. I stood out. They wanted to sleep in their tent. I said, my goodness, it's hotter than blazes out here. Coming to the RV, it's got air conditioning. No, we want to sleep in our new tent, new, you know, fairly new uh, weds and all like that. And I stepped out of our air conditioned comfort of her, and they stepped out of their tent, and they, they didn't notice. I see them in the distance. They're sitting in front of the AJ Jolly Park, and Rachel turns, and I see the pooch as she's about a few months away from delivery. And I cannot, I can tell you what happened, the experience. I felt the Lion King's song, the circle of life. I literally said to the Lord, now you can take me. Another generation of faith is to come. It's amazing. And yet the same baby, unexpected. How are we going to be able to afford this? How are we going to... Oh my goodness, the changes that we're going to make. And oh my goodness. And we used to be able to come and go and we, the same baby. Folks, life is not clean and easy. You bring babies into the world and Jesus said, bring them. Your responsibility is to reproduce your faith. And do you know what that means? Believers in Christ. You guys have been blessed with some wonderful. I've heard some Bible school teaching solid coming not only from the teachers, but also from the audience back to them. I thought, oh, man, God, this is what I grew up in. This is what I've envisioned. This is, this is what I love. This is what church should be. Good for them. No wonder LD. No wonder <coughs> Joyce fell in love with you. It's like, oh, my goodness, you guys you got a good thing going. Keep it going. But guess what? It's got to go to the next generation. You have to reproduce this. Jesus said, you want to love me? You want to get near to my heart? Feed. Oh, great. They're hungry again. This is laborious. Feed my land. And then Jesus asked the second time, don't worry. I'm going to go through, clip quickly through this. Do you love me? This is the priority of the church then. About leadership, maturity. Do you love me? He switched his language. He didn't say feed. He says take care of. That word in the Greek, take care of, literally means shepherd. Whatever needs done. You need to shovel out the stall. You sh Farmers, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, oh, I don't feel like getting up today. Those cattle don't take care of themselves. Those sheep don't take care of themselves. Those chickens don't take care of themselves. I thought I was going to get some chickens and I was well, what happens on vacation? No, I'm not going to do chickens. I'll just continue to pay outrageous prices for eggs. That's hard for Scotch Irish to do. I had all the supplies to build my own coops and I said, no, I'm burning them now. It doesn't stop every single day, day in, day out, whatever it takes. You know what? I can't look to the fact that there are coyotes out there for my sheep. I got to look to the fact I've heard wolves are moving into the territory. They're bigger, they're badder, and they can eat me. So you look to the future. If you're a leader, you have to look to the future of what is on the horizon. Let me tell you about the dangers I was taught in church camp and in Sunday school and in youth groups as a kid. Pick a date who'll make a good mate. Any of y'all grow up with that saying? Don't date anyone that you're not going to later marry. You be selective in what you're going to do. Talked about sexual purity as, as, as here I was, a young man that was later on gifted with hormones and, and all the other stuff that comes with it. And, and they're saying, faithful teachers, looking to my future. Scott, look to your future. Today's children... They're dealing with whether homosexual love. That's okay. No, it's not. Church leaders not, better not be teaching the same things that I was taught 50 years ago. You better be teaching in the present of where kids are now. And it's not just gay marriage, but the tweeners. It's the whether he's a male or a female, not understanding God's word is very clear. God made them male and female. The battles are different, but they're still the same. 
That's still the same because of four our kids. You need to be looking to the future. I want if you're if you're an elementary age student, can you stand where you're at? If you're elementary age, that's okay, Hannah. I check out too. Uh, you, you know what, kids? You're leaders. Did you know that? If you have Jesus in your heart, you're leading because the Bible says if you don't have Christ, those folks are blind. They don't know where they're going, what they're doing. But if you have Christ in your life, you have a chance to lead. Now, there's a spiritual gift of leadership. That's a different sermon, different time. Junior high, senior high, would you stand where you're at? Stand, please. If you're in junior high or senior high, please stand. What grade are you in? Yeah. Fifth. Okay, not yet. Junior high, senior high, please stand. Please stand. If you have Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know something. You may not be the captain of the football team. You may not be the best basketball player. You may be the shy, quiet person in the back of the class. That's okay. Because guess what? That was me. But God has called you to lead and to be a light. A light will draw people. So lead. Thank you. Please be seated. Any fathers or mothers in here? Any grandmas and grandpas in here? Don't worry, our knees creak. I'll let you stay seated. <laughs> Guess what? You've called to lead in your homes. When Jesus said this, Peter, do you love me? And he, he yes, Lord, you know I love you. He used that word philos again. And Jesus said, no, no, BFF. I want you to be sacrificial. Sacrifice. To lead you deacons, my goodness, do you sacrifice. But guess what? Sacrifice. Be ahead of the curve. Be going not, yes, holding to the things of the past, the truths of the past, but be forward thinking. What do we need to do to reach this unsaved people? And what do we do to mature the saints? The priority of the church is invested in leadership. I want to ask every one of you, who do you have following behind you right now? Who are you intentionally discipling? Not, well, we have programs in the church and we invite to youth group and we invite to church. All well and good, but that's accidental catching. I want you to become intentional in discipling. The practice of the church then leads if you have the priority of the church investing in your children, if you have the priority of the church investing in leading, of maturing, guess what? There's going to be a common practice in that happens here. And I see that and I'm blessed by it. The question of Jesus then comes up again the third time. And in this question, he shows the practice of the church focused towards fellowship. The question of Jesus, notice what Jesus did. He didn't use agape. Peter never did. Jesus twice did. And now he says, Peter, do you want to BFF me? You want to be a true friend of Jesus? The response of Peter, you almost hear it like your child that you've already told him three times. Mom, Mom, Dad, I've already told you. You know that I love you. He was hurt. That Jesus asked him the third time, you know that I feel oh, you, I feel lost you. And Jesus said, do what? He didn't say, feed my lambs. He didn't say, take care of my sheep. He said, feed my sheep. The feeding of the word of God is to always be a hallmark of this church. Feed. Did you catch that? Jesus switched terms. Why did he do that? Why did he then finally go to Peter's use of philos? I was doing some research on this, and some scholars have said this, that it's because Peter had not yet been given the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, Jesus told him, hey, you guys hang out. Wait in Jerusalem, and I'm going to send a gift, and it came on Pentecost. The Bible says the Holy Spirit was dumped on them. Who's the Holy Spirit? God. God, how can you do unconditional love unless God is in you? 
The guy who had 40 days earlier been scared spitless by a servant girl saying, you're one of those guys, aren't you? Is standing now in the shadow of the temple, the very ones who crucified Christ, and tells them, when they say, men and brothers, what do we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And he said, and the promise is for you and all who are far off, generation to generation. And then in Acts chapter 2, it tells us in verse 42 what happened as a result. Uh, prior to that, it mentions over 3,000, birthday of the church. Over 3,000 souls added. And then what did all those souls do? It said they met together. Why would all these people from different backgrounds want to meet together? Because now God, the same Spirit, was in each one of them. And they were attracted to one another because Agape had visited them. And it says, they met together for the apostles' doctrine, for the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and for prayer. So the practice of this church became one of fellowship, sharing together. In Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It's the evidence. How do I know my apple tree is an apple tree if it doesn't grow oranges, right? But it also has to produce fruit. It's called an apple. I have a peach tree in my yard. And that peach tree doesn't produce pears, doesn't produce cherries. It produces what? Peaches. And ultimately, I don't have that peach tree just for decoration. I want to taste the fruit. And it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Nine different aspects of it. But guess what? It's maybe not the, it doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit. Some scholars have said this. The fruit is love. Out of which flow joy. Out of which flow uh, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. All from love. Maybe there's just one fruit. What did Jesus say when asked one time? Lord, what is the greatest commandment? The first commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second liken to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. And so it is the practice of the church of fellowshipping with one another. Breaking out of my circles because I know you and I like you. We get along. We fishing buddies, whatever, whatever, whatever. No, I have a responsibility to each one in this body of Christ. BFF, more than that. And Jesus said, you want to get near my heart? Feed my lambs. I want to get near to my heart. After you give yourself what is nearest to my heart, feed my lambs, then take care of my sheep, and then feed my sheep. 1988, I saw this movie. Jenny and I is fairly young at that time. We hadn't yet reached 30 years of age. We went to the movie theater and watched a movie called The Bear. Now, let me set the scene for this. This little bear cub, what happened was hunters killed its mother trying to kill him, and he got away. And the rest of the movie is about him fleeing not just the hunters, but also this cougar who could easily take care of him and devour him. And his entire life thus far has been running, running, hiding, running, running, hiding. And you, you learned about this little bear cub. This is the closing scene of the movie. And I'll come back how God spoke to my heart then and how he's speaking to my heart now about. Can you play this for us? This little orphan bear. Man, I thought, oh, he remembered who he is. And that cougar, he's... And then when it panned up on that great big grizzly behind, I thought, oh, dear Lord, that is so like the Holy Spirit. When I'm cornered and I'm trapped and I'm about to be killed by Satan, a mighty archangel of God that even Michael in the book of Jude, even he didn't take Lucifer on. Another archangel, the archangel says, the Lord rebuke you. I thought the Holy Spirit of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But this last week, as I was looking deeply into the Gospel of John and looking here in chapter 21 about feed my lambs, all of a sudden I got a different image of it, not just the Holy Spirit, but in that great giant grizzly defending Scott Paul there was Mrs. Keene, Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Vance, Sunday school teachers, 
Betty and Mike Keene, youth group teachers. Richard Parks Davison, Tom Maul, Charles Gillum, pastors that were in my life, different people. And I saw their faces in that bear. They allowed me to be where I am now at 64 years of age. Who may one day stand at the gates of heaven because you fed the lambs of the lamb. Would you bow your heads? But the most important relationship of all, you can't even begin this journey unless you are in Christ. The one thing he wants is you. If you're a believer in Christ, if you've already taken that step, but you cannot say, this is the one I'm leading into relationship to mature them and to bring them into the fellowship of Christ, can I encourage you to surrender that to Christ today? To not sit and soak, but God, lead that person to me and that I'm to impact. Father, speak to each of our hearts. Help us to leave behind our failures. And may we become, or may we return to being fishers of men in Christ's name.